about 10 years ago, I was spending a lot of time in this library working on my dissertation, and it struck me that as I was writing about Irish literature from the World War II era, I was going to need to devote a chapter to Samuel Beckett's novel, Watt. When I said this to Dylan Johnston, he looked at me with eyes full of infinite weariness and said, I had hoped at this point in my career I would never have to read that novel again. <laughs> to which I replied whatever the 2009 version of sorry not sorry was um, and headed back to the third floor of the library. Um, the thing is Dylan is not alone. What has been historically the book in the Beckett canon that nobody wants to read? Um, it was rejected by about a dozen different publishers over a period of eight years, a fact that I actually think should give us all some hope. Um, in 1946, in an internal memo, Frederick Wartburg was rejecting the idea of serving as Beckett's agent, and he wrote, the book itself is too difficult. It shows an immense mental vitality, an outrageous metaphysical skill, and a very fine talent for writing. It may be that in turning this book down, we are turning down a potential James Joyce. What is it that this Dublin air does to these writers? Um, T.M. Ragg of Rutledge, who had published Murphy, was the first to have the honor of rejecting Watt, which he wrote to Beckett that he read with, quote, considerable bewilderment. It is too wild and unintelligible for the most part to stand any chance of successful publication. And why? So, just look. This is, these images are from the galley proof held here in the Olin Library. Do you see this? I'm not even going to read this to you. It's unlikely that anyone since the typesetter has actually read every single word of this novel. The novel is so riddled with lists and repetitions. For example, this is a, about a page and a half devoted to um, how a character called Mr. Knott moves from the fire to the bed, from the bed to the fire, from the bed to the fire, from the fire to the bed, and it goes on. Um, there's another catalog about the changes in Mr. Knott's physical appearance. For one day, Mr. Knott would be tall, fat, pale, and dark, and the next, thin, small, flushed, and fair, and the next, sturdy, middle-sized, yellow, and ginger, and the next, small, fat, pale, and fair. And this goes on <laughs> and ends to mention only the figure, skin, figure, stature, skin, and hair. Um, going through every possible permutation before it gets to the end. So much so that even the most devoted reader must fight the compulsion to skim. In other words, it's not just the publishers who found Watt unreadable. The novel is unreadable by design. Now, I'm not telling you this to put you off, although Dylan may have been trying to put me off. Um, you see, the galley proofs of Watt are, in my opinion, one of the crown jewels in the Olin Library's collection. And today I want to try to sell you on exactly why you should read this unreadable book, if you haven't. Um, although I admit, I've never assigned it to students. Um, and why it matters. And because we have this exciting archival material and we're celebrating Beckett's letters at this symposium, I want to begin with a bit of textual history. So I'll talk about how Watt came to be, why I think Beckett designed it as an unreadable text, and how the text's history gives us the context we need to be able to read it productively. So lest you begin and end like T.M. Ragg in bewilderment, I want to take a second to foreground what readers noticed was its immense vitality. Watt was the last novel that Beckett wrote in English before turning to French for the next 40 years. That in itself is enough to make a reader curious. What did writing this novel do to Samuel Beckett <laughs> to make him want to give up his language? In Watt, Beckett pushes the English language to its limits, and the lists and repetitions in the text push the reader to their limits as well. It can make you want to tear your hair out, but it's also hilarious. So I want to give you an example of the book being funny. So here, one of our first introductions to the protagonist, Mr. Watt, um, is he's trying to get on a train, and he's not having a very good experience in the train station. He's particularly bad at interpersonal relations. So this is a passage about Watt trying to smile. <laughs> 
Sorry, I keep getting my earring stuck in my, I'm just gonna take it off. Um, Watt had watched people smile and thought he understood how it was done. And it was true that Watt's smile, when he smiled, resembled more a smile than a sneer, for example, or a yawn. There was something wanting to Watt's smile. Some little thing was lacking. And people who saw it for the first time, and most people who saw it, saw it for the first time, were sometimes in doubt as to what expression exactly was intended. To many, it seemed a simple sucking of teeth. Watt used this smile sparingly. Its effect on the porter was to suggest to him words infinitely more disobliging than he had already employed. Um, so we have this, this guy, what? He just doesn't really know how to be a person, like many of Beckett's protagonists. The thing is, the right word for Watt, the novel, and of course it's hard to talk about Watt out loud because the novel and the protagonist have the same name, so I'll have to try to guess which one I'm talking about, um, is that it is hysterical in both major senses of the word. It is extremely funny, but it also exhibits the psychological disorder broadly known at this time period as hysteria. Not only Watt the character, but the novel as a whole appears to be somehow ill or unhinged. The text is unreadable, I argue, because it is a traumatic text in which the language, the plot, and the narrative form all express elements of trauma. Now, I want to tell you a bit about how we might call it a, a novel with an actual traumatic history. Um, the history, of, its history um, as a wartime manuscript in a post-war novel. So you get a sense of how the novel came to be in the first place. This is when I'm getting fancy with my new use of technology. I'm, I'm trying to do digital humanities. I don't know if I'm winning yet. Um, so. By 1939, um, when World War II began, Samuel Beckett was living on the Rue de Favorite in Paris with his partner, Suzanne Deschevaux du Mesny. And shortly after Paris fell to the Nazis, they began to get involved in the Résistance. And they joined a resistance cell called Gloria SMH. Beckett's role in the cell was translation. Um, he was a very handy person because he spoke perfect French and perfect English. And so his role was to collate scraps of information, translate them into English, after which they were photographed on really tiny slivers, rolled up into film canisters, and smuggled to the Ministry of Information. Um, so that mostly they were talking about um, Nazi troop movements in France and gun emplacements and also just whispered overheard rumors. He wasn't gathering the information, but he was co putting it together and translating it. Um, but in 1943, their cell was betrayed from an internal double agent, a former Jesuit priest at that. Um, and Beckett and Suzanne got tipped off about 10 minutes before the Gestapo came to their apartment. Um, they fled, and because he was Beckett, he brought the manuscript of Watt with him, a novel that he had begun in 1941. Um, after hiding out, sometimes sleeping under floorboards, once actually apparently sleeping in a tree. Um, Beckett and Suzanne were smuggled, um, having traveled sort of by car and by foot to free France and applied um, to live in the Vaucluse in, in the town of Roussillon, which to us, I think, looks like a perfect tourist location. Mm -hmm. I was actually in the Vaucluse last fall, and it is just the most beautiful place on earth like that mountains, you're there, there's lavender, and you think, oh, French vacation, not for Beckett. This was no vacation for him. Mostly, it was because they couldn't leave. They did not have permission to leave, essentially, the county. And um, they stayed for a while in a hotel, the Hotel Escoffier, where he tried to write again, but he only managed two lines in the notebooks. Um, and in 1943, this whole scrolling thing has got me, they were able to rent a house where they lived from, 19, from early 1943 through 1945. Um, Beckett worked um, on a farm by, from, owned by a guy called Bonnelly, who is sort of made famous in Gatto because Vladimir and Estragon talk about doing the Vendange at Bonnelly's farm. And um, that's traces of his actual experience um, in Roussillon. But some of these traces, I argue, come up in Watt as well. So I just want to show you some pictures of the Watt notebooks. Um, this is 
He wrote on these school notebooks. We have some of them out there in the lobby today. He wrote to, to his agent, George Reeby, that it's an unsatisfactory book written in dribs and drabs, first on the run, then of an evening after the clod hopping during the occupation. But it has its place in the series, as will perhaps appear in time. And this series was a series that he imagined that basically comprised of Murphy, Watt, Mercier, Camier, Malloy, Malone, Mert, and then at that point he said he hoped that um, Malone would be the last of the series, and of course he was wrong. Um, and Okay, so these are some of the notebooks. You can see they're, they're very odd and wonderful. He scribbled, he, he later said he wrote the book partly in order to keep in touch. Um, James Nolson, his biographer, says he wrote it to keep from going insane, um, although you might argue that the book itself is a sign that he was going insane. Um, but it's full of these wonderful doodles um, and lots of scratching out. So. Um, <laughs> the manuscript was twice confiscated and, expected and inspected for code. So when, um, in 1945, Beckett and Suzanne were able to go back to Paris, um, Beckett set off for Dublin to visit his ailing mother, whom he hadn't seen since before the war, and he had to travel through London, where he was instantly stopped at customs. His passport was confiscated, as was the manuscript of Watt, which he was carrying around. And you can imagine the mystification this may have caused um, the customs agents. Um, fortunately for Beckett, other former members of his resistance cell had already um, met with the, the Ministry of Information and been debriefed, and so they actually knew who he was. He was a known agent. Um, he was able to explain on the basis of his publication history that this really was a novel, and they let him go. So off he trotted um, to, do I have it on this map? Okay. Oh, here's my map. Here we go. So off he trots. I don't know what happened to my formatting here. I apologize. Um, to Rutledge, who were the publishers of Murphy, hoping he could pick up um, some royalties when he was informed that Murphy had been remaindered and was out of print and there was no money for him whatsoever, which is pretty bad news. So they said, okay, we'll agree to have a look at this manuscript. And that was in April, and by June it was rejected. And it began this sort of parade of rejections. Watt was rejected by Rutledge, Rutledge Chateau and Windus, Warburg, Methuen, Jonathan Cape, Friedberg, Hamish Hamilton. Um, Beckett was represented at this time by several different agents who also gave up on him, um, including Curtis Brown, Nicholson and Watson, wonderfully R.P. Watt, the Watt brothers, which even Beckett thought was really funny. And the poor, um, they write back and say that to risk a pun would be too easy. We're very sorry. We can't take your novel. Um, and finally, by George Reavy, his um, longtime agent and friend. So um, it's not until after Beckett achieves newfound fame after um, the first productions of Waiting for Godot and after the, the first pu pieces of the trilogy came out that he was able to find a publisher for Watt, which he referred to Reavy as Our Old Misery. So he, um, he sends the book, I'm just trying to play with maps now, to um, he gives a copy to Dennis Devlin, the poet and diplomat, um, to take to Washington with him, and then complains later that that blessed fellow Devlin has the only other copy in Washington and I suppose is doing nothing about it. Um, Devlin was a career diplomat and served as Ireland's envoy to the U.S. He never did do anything about the novel. Um, eventually, though, after, well, whew, Sorry, so ugly. Um, in 1950, um, an extract of Watt, according to Beckett, massacred by the compositor, has appeared in that filthy new Irish rag envoy, um, which he was, he basically gave the envoy crew um, an extract of Watt just to sort of see what they would do, and then complained about it when they published it. Um, he eventually finds a home for it. Um, with the Merlin group in Paris. So he says to Reavy, our old misery Watt, 
is with the Merlin juveniles here in Paris who are beginning a publishing industry. So this is actually pretty bizarre. So the collection Merlin from the Olympia Press also published porn. Um, they published light porn and they published they published the Marquis de Sade in, trans, in French and English translation. Um, and so eventually, when Watt comes out, um, it's printed on August 31st, 1953, um, in an edition of 1,125 copies. And those are the galley proofs that we have of it, as it's here at the Olin Library. Um, Beckett was really pretty disappointed. Um, he writes to Con Leventhal in Dublin, Watt is having a difficult birth, but is expected out into the dark of day next week. <laughs> and then notes in the same letter, revival of Gada with Blen and company at the Theatre of Babylon, September 20th. So this gives us a sense of the real time gap in Beckett's writing career between Gatto already being revived um, with his preferred cast and Watt finally coming out eight years after he finished writing it. Um, but in October of 1953, the Olympia Press is raided by the Paris Vice Squad. And once again, they seized the plates of Watt. What they saw was the plate that had to be specially made for the Song of the Frogs, which they thought might be some sort of pornographic code. <laughs> um, it's later, he, um, in 1954, he writes to Barney Rossett in New York at Grove Press, oh, 1953, Watt, I believe, is out now, but I've not yet seen it. Standards of book presentation here are not the same as with you, and the resources at Merlin are very limited. What matters to me is this work refused by a score of London publishers in the years following the war is at last between boards. A handsomer edition in America would, of course, give me great pleasure. Um, which Grove duly put out the next year. Um, and then this edition, which which still pretty riddled with imperfections, remains a standard text of Watt until 2009 when Grove and Faber reissue a new edition edited by Chris Ackerley. Uh, by 1954, oh, I'll save that quote for later, hold on. So that's sort of the story of Watt finally making it to us. And so one of the things that makes what strange in the Beckett canon is that we, it, readers of Beckett found, met it out of order. They had already, the trilogy and Gatto had already been published, and then here comes this sort of ju, almost by then juvenile work of Beckett's, who is now only writing in French. And this sort of last English language novel comes out, and people don't really know what to do with it, so they sort of ignore it and give up on it. Um, so. I want to give you, try to give you a quick treatment of the plot before I tell you why we should read this as a traumatic text. Um, so, Mr. Watt, your kind of typical shambling Beckett protagonist, arrives after train travel difficulties at the gothic-ish big house of Mr. Knott with its chimneys in the light of the moon. And um, he arrives and the, his predecessor a guy called Arsene leaves, gives a sort of 24-page monologue, that, and then out the door, and Watt begins his service in the household of Knott. He's the downstairs servant. Mr. Watt is weird, but Watt, but Mr. Knott, sorry, there's a sort of joke, like, Watt? Knott. Um, <laughs> Mr. Knott is weird, but Watt never sees him in this first part of the novel. One of his primary jobs is preparing his food, which, to give you a sense of how odd this universe is, is made once a week in a large pot, and he basically pours in any ingredient that might be healthful, ranging from Guinness to fish, um, stirs it all up in one pot, and then it is served to Mr. Knott at regular intervals twice a day, the remainder of which should be fed to the dog, which causes Watt considerable difficulty figuring out how he's supposed to feed this to the dog, because there is no dog. Um, Watt's problem is that he is relentlessly rational. And so he tries out a, like, a sort of endless sequence of rational explanations, problems, solutions, problems with the solutions to every event that he's faced with. Uh, ultimately, he then, another servant arrives. Watt moves upstairs to replace a guy called Erskine as Mr. Knott's personal valet. And then things get really weird because as you have seen, Mr. Knott does not look the same every day. The furniture moves in weird ways. Um, and Watt becomes sort of so ultimately puzzled that he loses his grip on language and is unable to speak. 
Um, the novel ends temporarily with Watt leaving for a train station and buying a ticket to the end of the line. Um, but the whole thing is told out of order, and you find out halfway through the novel that your whole thing is being narrated by another person called Sam, to whom Watt has related this story in a space that seems to be some sort of asylum. Um, and so Sam tells us that everything he knows comes from Watt. Um, okay. The, um, the manuscript of Watt, Stan Gontarsky called the white whale of Beckett studies, <laughs> a mass of documentation that defies attempts to make sense of it. The same might be said of the published novel. The intentional disarrangement, or in fact derangement of the novel, is I think a trace of Beckett's wartime experience. I'm not the first to read Watt's resistant language as a product of Beckett's engagement with the war. Uh, Marjorie Perloff has connected Watt and Sam's bizarre conversations with the code system used by Beckett's cell in the French Resistance. Um, Beckett's job was, of course, a job of translation and transcription, and in fact, we also see Sam, the narrator of the novel, doing sort of the same thing. Um, it's, um, it's difficult not to see the connection between the translation work of the resistance agent Sam Irland Dye, it was a really sneaky name, mm -hmm. Irish Sam, um, and that of Watt's narrator, Sam, who translates Watt's cryptic utterances into the English language narrative of Watt, the novel. With its long, often pages long sentences, composed of seemingly endless dependent clauses, the syntax of Watt seems burdened by a language that appears self-censored or unwilling to speak. Watt's fraught language is certainly a response to the strange pressures war puts on language. War alters language use in fundamental ways which, that draw our attention to the ways in which propaganda, as Orwell and Adorno have argued, is seductive, and like espionage and code, requires special reading skills. But war also alters the people who survive it. In Watt's resistant language, Mr. Watt's search for semantic succor, as he calls it, is also a trace of wartime trauma. In part one of the novel, Watt has an encounter with the Gauls' father and son, who come, quote, what is more, all the way from town to tune the piano. It's one of the more telling traumatic traces in the text. The Gauls' visit turned sinister after they depart, having concluded that, quote, the piano is doomed, the piano tuner also, the pianist also. <laughs> but what happens is like a half-remembered tune, the incident of the Gauls, or at least Watt's memory of it, persists. Um, the incident, quote, was not ended when it was passed, but continued to unfold in Watt's head from beginning to end, over and over again. So this is no simple remembering of an event because it distresses Watt intensely, and it seems to him unreasonably. So let's see. Uh-oh. Just kidding. I don't have that part. I'll read it to you. I'll give you back the frogs. Okay. What distressed Watt, Sam tells us, was not so much that he did not know what had happened, for he did not care what had happened, that a thing that was nothing had happened with the utmost formal distinctness, and that it continued to happen in his mind, and it revisited him in such a way that he was forced to submit to it all over again, to hear the same sounds, see the same lights, touch the same surfaces, and so on. If he had been able to accept it, then perhaps it would not have revisited him. And this would have been a great saving of vexation, to put it mildly. Um. The visit of the Gauls reads as a traumatic event. Their, quote, fugitive penetration into the not estate is something Watt cannot quite grasp. Like any traumatic event, the nature of its occurrence escapes Watt only to make itself present through repetition. Um, consistent with Kathy Carruth's definition of trauma as, quote, the response to an unexpected or overwhelming violent event or events that are not fully grasps at, grasped as they occur, but return later in repeated flashbacks, nightmares, and other repetitive phenomena, close quote. The experience of the Gauls' galling visit slips away impossible to witness. Watt's encoding of this, merely a visit from the piano tuner, something that ought to seem like nothing, is an example of how the novel censors and subverts traumatic experience. <laughs> 
but Beckett's customarily sardonic humor in the tuner's general proclamation of doom hints at something much darker beneath the surface. Watt needs to tell the story to be able to accept it, but he finds himself unable to speak. The event, true to its traumatic nature, as Carruth would put it, simultaneously defies and demands our witness. And now, because the time is shorter than I thought it was, I'm going to skip the part where I talk to you guys about um, the politics of Irish neutrality in the Second World War. Um, one of the things that's key to my reading of this novel is contextualizing it as an Irish representation of the Second World War and connecting it to the way that news was censored in Ireland so that in the Irish media, um, the government had a policy of censoring all reports of cruelty, persecution, and atrocities, quote, for fear of eliciting unneutral sympathy. And the effect of this is that there's a sort of very bizarre dance with interpretation that has to go on when, every th when there's a presumption that language is neutral. Um, there's also this presumption that Ireland did not experience World War II, which is untrue. It's just a different sort of trauma, almost a missed trauma, the trauma of the thing you weren't part of but were. Uh, so um, I argue that Watts' linguistic contortions and distortions enact an implicit criticism of the Irish government's wartime policy of, quote, neutral language. That was literally their the way they put it. This policy, the linchpin of I Ireland's wartime neutrality, um, was based on the government's twinned mandates that public language could be neutered by refusing to name the war and that it would function as a neutral medium by offering unbiased descriptors of a belligerent world. Um, this is, of course, the same Irish state that would go on and ban Watt in 1954, um, just presuming on the basis of the fact that they didn't understand it, that it wasn't suitable for consumption. Um, so in the thoroughly peculiar language of Watt, Beckett demonstrates what happens when language's presumed neutrality is followed to a rational dead end. Every attempt to express what he has seen in Mr. Knott's estate brings Watt closer to disintegration. His witnessing offers only a grammar of traumatic repetition. Because he imagines that he can simply interpret a complicated world, Watt's quest for enlightenment actually leaves him, quote, dumb, numb, and blind. Um, the problem of accessing truth in wartime is compounded, compounded by the problem of how to articulate it. And this is made very evident for the reader of Watt in confronting the novel's total failure of narrative authority. So you're halfway through the novel before Sam suddenly introduces himself as narrator, upsetting the reader's assumption of a more plausible third-person omniscient narrator. And disclaiming, Sam says, for all I know on the subject of Mr. Knott and all that touched Mr. Knott and on the subject of Watt and all that touched Watt came from Watt and from Watt alone. And this does not mean either that I may not have left out some of the things that Watt told me or forced it in others that Watt never told me. Not only does Sam admit to the inaccuracy of the material provided by Watt, particularly our scene's 24-page monologue, now retold third-hand, Sam's position as a narrator is made impossible by the opening close and closing pages of the novel itself. Um, there's no way that Watt could have seen or heard Mr. Hackett in the opening scene or the railway employees in the closing one, so Sam's narrative is doubly dubious. This is reminiscent of both the impossible position of any traumatic testimony and the impossibility for Irish readers of accessing the truth of what was happening in the war they were not witnessing. The fact that the narrator of Watt both knows too little and too much is underscored formally by metafictional intrusions such as the narrator's frequent admissions of ignorance, I'll say things like, but when out walking, Watt's knees did not bend for some obscure reason. Um, periodic question marks inserted in place of words, and a hiatus in manuscript just left smack in the middle of a page at the end of the novel. Um, these moments of narrative skepticism are intentionally disconcerting. Holes in the narrative, like the hiatus and the novel's lists, are placed intentionally at moments of highest suspense, exasperating the reader. Furthermore, there are eight pages of addenda at the end of the novel, 
which follow the which are followed by the remark the following precious and illuminating material should be carefully studied only fatigue and disgust prevented its incorporation like Watt to Mr. Knott, quote, weak now of eye, hard of hearing, and with the even the more intimate senses greatly below par, Sam, as a narrator, is a needy witness, an imperfect witness. And with these uncertain witnesses, the novel's metafictional elements work to undermine narrative authority and break the traditional bond between reader and narrator, frustrating a process intuited as a rational one. So if a rational readerly response is to reread the text, Watt lampoons such rationalism by enacting its own rereading. In part three, the reader witnesses Sam's difficulty in translating Watt's inverted speech into recognizable English. As the section begins, Sam admits that in reporting Watt's strange tale of life in Mr. Knott's service, he must struggle with Watt's manner of expression. Um, I hope I have the right one here. Okay, no. Well, I'll put this up here now. Um, he tells us that when Watt spoke, he spoke in a low and rapid voice. Watt spoke also with scant regard for grammar, for syntax, for pronunciation, for enunciation, and very likely for spelling, too. <laughs> Watt spoke as one speaking to dictation or reciting a parrot-like text by long repetition become familiar. Of this impetuous murmur, much fell in vain on my imperfect hearing and understanding and much by the rushing wind was carried away. <laughs> this is the person who's narrating our novel. Um, so what we have is this motif of translation, Watt translating his experiences with Mr. Knott, Sam translating Watt's disordered story into Watt the novel, and the reader translating Watt the novel into sort of some sort of sense. Um, and I think it also hints at a form of, of working through trauma, of talking about the experience until it can be made whole again. But for Watt, this just can't work. It goes wonky. Um, so when, um, at one point, Sam tells us that um, Watt now walked as he talked back, back to front. He's now walking backwards. And they walk and they talk. And he says, day of most, night of part, not with now. Now till up, little seen so o, oh, little heard so o, oh, night till morning from. Heard I this, saw I this, then what? Thing quiet, dim, ears, eyes, failing now also, hush in, mist in, moved I so. And Sam says, from this, it will perhaps be suspected that the inversion affected not only the sentences, but that, not the order of the sentences, but that of the words only, and eventually um, that there was more, perhaps more than a reversal of discourse, that the thought was perhaps inverted. Um, the next thing, so like Sam at this point, the reader can still understand a great part of what Watt says by quickly reversing the words and the clauses. As Watt's thoughts become more garbled, his inversions become more complicated, but the reader's skill improves along with Sam's. Phrases like Watt's geb nodrap for beg pardon soon become as familiar to the reader as real words. But Watt's complex inversions require more and more complex reading skills. So by the end of the story, um, Watt begins to invert the letters in the word together with that of the words in the sentence together with that of the sentences in the period. For example, dis yib dis, nem out, yad la, ten fo trap, skin, skin, skin. Odd su did ned ta, I love that I'm being filmed. On ta ot clat tonk, on tonk ot clat ta, on tonk ta cool ta, on Ta ta cool tonk, nilb man mud. <laughs> Ten fo trap yad la, nim out, dis yib dis. Um, it took me some time to get used to this. Um, I think it's important to hear it out loud because you sort of get a sense of the impossibility of trying to read this. Now, most readers, if my experience is any indication, will find themselves either fighting the desire to skip the text as unreadable, throw it out the window, or make provisional translations in the margin. So my rendering of this episode is, side by side, two men, all day, part of night, dumb, numb, blind, not look at what? No. What look at not? No. What talk to not? No. 
Not talk to what? No. What then did us do? Nix, nix, nix. Part of night, all day. Two men, side by side. Who, taking into account Watt's known scant regard for grammar, syntax, punctuation, and spelling, adapting these passages into English requires actual translation more than mere transliteration. The novel, prophetically perhaps, as Beckett's last English novel, is a work in translation. Um, so any information that, um, what, about Mr. Watt, Mr. Knott, that a reader might glean is read tendentiously in third hand. Um, so sort of as you, as the reader tries to translate, Watt gets worse and worse in talking and disintegrates more. Um, he has, okay, I gotta skip. So the, one of the most painful problems of reading the novel is that Watt will conjecture about something for five or six pages, and then you'll find out on the next page that the whole thing was pointless, and he either made it all up. There was already an answer to the problem before he thought through it. Um, and so you've just read these 10 annoying pages, and it, it was pointless altogether. But Beckett is essentially making you experience this frustration to read the novel. Um, get to the, my sort of favorite bit which is when um, Watt is trying to achieve what he calls semantic succor um, by being able to speak about anything that he sees. And um, says, for Watt, um, I don't have the same, I'm gonna read what I have here. So it's gonna end up with this top one though. For Watt now found himself in the midst of things which if they consented to be named, did so as it were with reluctance. Looking at a pot, for example, or thinking of a pot, at one of Mr. Knott's pots, of one of Mr. Knott's pots, it was in vain that Watt said, pot, pot. Well, perhaps not quite in vain, but very nearly. For it was not a pot. The more he looked, the more he reflected, the more he felt sure of that, that it was not a pot at all. It resembled a pot. It was almost a pot. But it was not a pot of which one could say, pot, pot and be comforted. For he could always hope of a thing which he had never known the name, that he would learn the name someday and so be tranquilized. Now Watt undergoes a process in which the true names of all things cease to exist. This is what happens when you study for too long, I think. Um, their essence cannot be grasped in language in a world where language itself becomes skeptical. For Watt, this shattering, shattering of the bond between the signified and signifier is as painful as it is confusing. And Watt's need of semantic succor was at times so great that he would almost set to trying names on things and on himself, almost as a woman hats. And for himself, I'm, I'm just gonna skip a bit here. And as for himself, though he could no longer call it a man as he had used to do, with the intuition that he was perhaps not talking nonsense, yet he could not imagine what else to call it if not a man. So he continued to think of himself as a man, but for all the relief that this afforded him, he might just as well have thought of himself as a box or an urn. If the premise of the narrative is that Watt tells his story to Sam, then his story is the narrative enactment of his linguistic breakdown in the face of an attempt to find semantic succor in explaining himself to another. But testimony by its nature is always censored, always doubtful, and Watt's traumatic experiences even lead him to doubt his own humanity. His predicament echoes Mr. Hackett's wonderment at the beginning of the book that Watt is a man rather than a roll of carpet or, quote, a tarpaulin wrapped up in dark paper and tied about the middle with a cord, suggesting that Watt's humanity is in doubt from the very beginning of the novel, the first time the reader sees him. Um, of course, it's equally, po oh, okay, sorry. Watt's ontological problem encodes trauma. He could be a man or the remains of one, a box or an urn just as it hints at the semantic problems arising from it. It is, of course, equally possible that the words box, urn, carpet, tarpaulin could describe what, man being as arbitrary a signifier as any. But without the ability to trust that words and their meanings are connected, Watt's world, Sam explains, becomes, quote, unspeakable. Unspeakable is, of course, an adjective inextricably associated with the descriptions of World War II. 
Today, the Holocaust, the K-10 massacre, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki are often troped as unspeakable events. No one can witness to his own death. No words can commensurate with what occurred. On another level, these events were officially unspeakable in a neutral Ireland that censored news reports of wartime atrocities, lest they engender unneutral thoughts. As an imperfect witness of Mr. Knott, what deals in unspeakability, witnessing a household so traumatically baffling that all his attempts, attempts at testimony lead to silence? Watt's traumatic self-censoring should also recall the sensorial notion of unspeakability, that about which we are forbidden or unwilling to speak. As Naomi Mandel writes, quote, what is unspeakable evokes the privileges and problems inherent in speech while actively distancing itself from them, performing a rhetorical sleight of hand that simultaneously gestures toward and away from the complex ethical negotiations that representing atrocity entails." Close quote. So the unspeakable names a double-edged form of censorship. On the one hand, the psyche's self-censoring of traumatic experience, on the other, an officialized unwillingness to speak. The latter provides a seductive opportunity for evasion, couched in the moral high ground offered by the term unspeakable. This is what makes it dangerous. Even though by 1954, Beckett had written to a friend that the idea of what made him go purple right down to his bones, which is better in French, because like em, em, it was empurpled his bones. Um, there's something about the wild vitality of this novel that demands our attention. Classing it as unreadable, the inverse of unspeakable, is too easy an evasion. But to learn how to read it is to learn about working through about witnessing, and also about seductive fish women, <laughs> and its contribution to the ethical contortionism that is late modernist prose is well worth our effort. <laughs>